one part of my job here at Temple is to hire qualified Hebrew teachers, of which I see some of you in the room. Usual qualities I look for in all teachers include being passionate about Judaism, to like working with kids, and of course to be available on Sunday mornings, and some others. But to be able to teach Hebrew, there is the obvious requirement of Hebrew proficiency, and the less obvious requirement of being able to explain what a prefix, a suffix, and various other grammatical concepts like prepositions are in English. We spend way more time on Sundays doing that than you would think. While knowing what all the words mean in a prayer is important to understanding, being able to see how they connect to one another is where the real meaning-making happen, the meaning-making magic happens. So let us take a timely example from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 16 specifically. Here Esther is talking to Mordechai before her preparations to go before the king. And we know things are not looking very great for the Jews right now. And after declaring that every Jew should fast for three days alongside her, we get this phrase that indicates she will go before the king. And most translations, there's websites where you can go see like 14 at a time, include a simple conjunction, and then I'll go before the king. But that pesky little conjunction, glossed over by most translations, actually indicates a much bigger message. In Hebrew, that pesky conjunction is the word uvechen, and therefore. It's a logical connector indicating the consequence of the previous thing. As in, it is raining, uvechen, I'll bring an umbrella. Instead of just, and then I'll go, in our story, it carries the force of saying, my people are in danger, therefore I must go. And I read this with a similar emotional state to Anna in Frozen 2, saying, I live with children, saying that the dam needs to fall even though it will destroy Arendelle. The full second half of our verse reads, therefore, I'll go before the king even though it is against the law, and if I die, I die. Looking at those little word, that little word, it emphasizes her dedication to her people, even to the point of jeopardizing her own life. And yes, I recognize, I probably have you all asking yourselves why Grammar Minutia and Esther are timely to Rosh Hashanah. I do know what holiday it is. And you may have correctly guessed that it might have something to do with this word, uvchen. This little word, appears precisely once in the entire Hebrew Bible, the verse I just told you about. It appears three times in every Kedusha blessing in every Amidah of the High Holidays. Once in the Bible, but we hear it a lot. Based on a commentary in another Machsor, this word was chosen for the High Holiday Kedusha inserts because of its meaning in Esther. The liturgists wanted us to feel like Esther, that hesitancy, the feeling of unworthiness, trepidation, and yet also a confidence in knowing that we are making the right choice despite the risk. However, unlike Esther, as we approach the high holidays, we have a little more faith that God will hear our plea than she did of King Ahasuerus. Now, the Kedusha blessing, some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not. Um, it is the third blessing, and I was going to ask Courtney to give us the Nikadesh, but I forgot to do that, and I will not put her on the spot. You will hear it tomorrow morning um, when we sing versus read it. Sound familiar? In the rabbinic imagination is our human attempt to be angels in the heavenly court, standing legs together like, like the angels is one fused leg, raising on our toes to ascend up high, calling out the responses in unison with the angels. It's a beautiful image. 
And at the end of the opening, as we turn the page, we come back to the earthly realm and find these three Uvachain paragraphs. In place, of the weekday in place of their weekday supplication counterparts. It's as if we, can't, if we can't stay in heaven, therefore this is what is going to happen. Uvachain, this is what will happen on earth. We will sense God's holiness through awe, that's paragraph one, through honor and through righteousness, and they appear in that order. In that first paragraph, Uvchen tein pachtecha Adonai Eloheinu, al kol maasecha. And so in your holiness give all creation the gift of awe. Regarding awe, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel might come to mind. He writes, the surest way to suppress our ability to understand the meaning of God and the importance of worship is to take things for granted. Indifference to the sublime wonder of living is the root of sin. Through his lens of radical amazement, we connect with God, while often used to increase our sense of awe over daily wonders. In our high holiday kedusha, awe comes through the connection with all that lives. Awe is to be able to look at the diversity among the people in the world and connect with those who are most like us and those who are less like us. To imagine a world where the web of interconnectedness weaves us together into a united whole fabric. The words for awe in Hebrew, yirah and pachad, can also mean fear. I believe the difference is in how we interpret our experience. In the face of the inexplicable, our sense of faith and trust is what brings awe to the surface instead of fear. Esther goes before the king, though she feels of little merit, to say, have awe for those in your kingdom who are different than you. Do not fear our ways as Haman does. Allow us to live freely and peacefully as we have before. Imagine having the same courage to spread awe in our world. As I think back on this past year, it feels like fear has all too often overpowered awe. We find security guards stationed to decide who can enter. We hear pre-election political ads on all sides that are intended to rouse our sense of fear. Statements about Israel of any sort have been construed to imply far beyond their direct context. Calling for the return of the hostages gets taken as expressing apathy for the plight of the Gazan civilians and the reverse. And now we are seeing hostility because of one's Haitian heritage. And in the face of all of that, we plead so desperately to feel God's awe bringing connection, unity, and strength in the year ahead and so we say, therefore, God, give us awe. And we turn the page. Uvchen tein kavod Adonai l'amcha. And so in your great holiness, give your people the gift of honor. This second insertion in our prayer book, as, as our prayer book notes, reflects the yearning of the Jewish people, often marginalized, misunderstood, and despised, for honor and recognition, a secure place among the nations. It is not that Israel seeks accolades, but we pray for security and safety. We ask God to continue to honor us as a single united people. Remember, we already have that unity from awe. And we strive to bring honor to the world. With the knowledge of our experience of slavery in Egypt, we know all too well the importance of safety and security for all peoples. On and after October 7th, the Jewish people learned painfully that many seeming Jewish allies were no longer at our side. It was a reminder that true allyship is unconditional. And I've heard from many of you that we feel more vulnerable, more isolated, 
and heartbroken by the anti-Israel and anti-Jewish rhetoric and actions here and abroad. Our community trip to honor our Holocaust scroll was canceled in part because of these sentiments. I have been asked countless times, is it safe to come? When the world looks to us with fear instead of awe, honor cannot follow. Some of you may remember pre-pandemic, I know that was a very long time ago, discussions of Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, which challenged readers to see their actions as one of two things, racist, contributing to historical bias and inequity, and anti or anti-racist, actively dismantling that framework. He argues there's really no neutral in the middle. If we use that same thought for honor, interaction with another either brings honor or dishonor to that person. There is no neutral. Therefore, we pray and remind ourselves to strive to make all of our interactions ones that bring honor to the world. And despite our lived experience, we as Jews continue to pray for a peaceful future for all through divine honor and through human honor. Through our acts of tikkun olam, we give honor to the vulnerable unconditionally. And it may feel self-defeating as there will always be voices saying that we have not done enough. We know the work is great, we know the day is short, and we will not be able to complete the work. But we also know we cannot desist from doing it. Therefore, God, give us honor. And then we turn the page. Uvchain tzadikim yiru v'yismachu. And so in your holiness, give the righteous the gift of a vision bright with joy, a world where evil has no voice. This third paragraph is the most future-driven, imagining a world where concepts, evil, malevolence, arrogance, have no power in the world. Unlike our early Sidorim and even some up through as late as the 12th century, we do not pray for things like apostates to have no hope, our enemies to be cut off, or sinners to be blotted out from the world. Rather, we wish that sinners turn from their ways and live, that actions driven by arrogance and hatred cease. In this way, we envision a world where righteousness has more power than wickedness. We imagine a world where we can turn from our misdeeds and make better choices. And if you were paying very close attention, you may have noticed the phrasing is a little bit different on this last paragraph. We've already proved little things have big meanings. We do not ask for righteousness, as we did with the honor and the awe paragraphs. Rather, we ask that the righteous ones be given hope. The assumption is that sadikim, righteous people, will always exist. The plea is that they still have hope that the future can be brighter. Amid all of this heaviness, the hatred, injustice, and loneliness, amid what many of my generation or younger might call the dumpster fire that is our world right now, we keep alive this vision of a world at peace. In this bleak world, therefore, God, give the righteous hope. But our prayer doesn't end quite there. It continues one more page. Just when you think you're done, there's more. The last line of the prayer before we close it off contains a quote from Isaiah. The source of all might is exalted through justice, the God of holiness made holy through righteousness. Through the experience of uniting people with awe, through bringing safety and security with honor, and the hope that righteousness will prevail, we not only sense Kedusha, God's holiness, but we bring Kedusha, we bring that holiness into the world. It's a lofty statement, and in reality, a challenging ask. And so one application among so many 
I could have chosen, but I figured you did not want to be here all night. We've heard the claims against the Haitian community in Springfield. I suspect the majority of the news and online chatter about the matter comes from people who have not spent much, if any, time in Springfield, Ohio. And even if they have, have they interacted meaningfully with this community? I can also say much of the news and online chatter lacks awe, lacks honor, and lacks genuine righteousness. Rather, it often dehumanizes and others a community that differs from the speaker's own. With awe, we can bring holiness to Springfield by appreciating Haitian culture, perhaps by trying a local restaurant, learning about their customs and values that they hold dear. Governor DeWine in one article mentioned having visited Haiti and seeing very challenging living situations, how school children would leave their homes, their dilapidated homes, with clean, pressed clothing. Local business owners in Springfield, not from the Haitian community, will tell you how Haitian migrants helped kept Springfield alive during the pandemic because of their work ethic. With awe, not with fear, we see that the Haitian community brings added value to those around them. With honor, we can bring holiness to Springfield. One thing that has become clear is that the fear stirred through claims meant to harm the Haitian community, the entire Springfield community, is now more vulnerable. The Haitian community, people of color, and other minorities have been targets of rising hatred. Schools closed, businesses closed, hospitals were locked down. People share that they do not feel safe driving after dark. In Springfield, the pets are safe, but the people are not. Springfield needs words of truth and dignity. And with honor, we can increase safety for all. And therefore, Ufchain, we need righteousness and a vision for a better tomorrow. We need to bring awe for the sake of community. We need to bring honor for the sake of dignity. And we need to bring righteousness and hope for the sake of a peaceful future. Our failures of awe and honor challenge the hopes and vision of righteousness. Ufchain, therefore God, let us feel your holiness. Ufchain, therefore God, let us bring your holiness into the world through our actions this year. Ufchain, therefore God, let this year be a good year for us, for all Jews, and all the world. Ken Yehirat Son. We continue as we turn to page 78. <laughs> 